Hi class, welcome back to thermodynamics. Today we're going to continue on computing changes in entropy for processes. So we've been focusing on internally reversible processes. So that's when that sigma in the Clausius inequality is set equal to zero. That is an internally, that signifies an internally reversible process. So let's have a refresher on the Carnot cycles. We're going to look at the Carnot power cycle and the Carnot refrigeration or heat pump cycle as seen or as shown on a TS diagram, so a temperature entropy diagram. So for power, remember each Carnot cycle consists of two isothermal and two adiabatic processes, and they are, the whole cycles, the cycles are reversible, internally reversible. So for a power cycle where we have T, S, we're going to have some higher temperature, some lower temperature, And then entropy, there, we're going to have two entropies as well. So let's start at state one. So one to two is going to be a process that uh, is adiabatic. So we have constant entropy. For this process. No, delta S is zero. And then we're going to go through to uh, two to three is going to be isothermal at our higher temperature. And we have an increase in entropy. Three to four is going to be once again adiabatic. So delta S is zero, no change in entropy. And then finally, we're going to have our last isothermal process, and that'll bring us back to the beginning. So you notice when you show a Carnot cycle on a TS diagram that we have this perfect box. It looks like a box. So we, we have delta S is zero for the adiabatic processes, and delta T is zero for the isothermal processes. Looking at now a refrigeration or a heat pump cycle. I'm going to draw yet another TS diagram. And once again, we're going to have TH and TC. And we'll start at TC. But this time we'll start on our isothermal process. So it goes in the opposite direction of our power cycle. So we have an increase in entropy from one to two. Then we have our iso, we have um, our adiabatic process where we have an increase in temperature and delta S is zero from two to three. Then we have our next isothermal process from three to four at the higher temperature. And then we return with our last adiabatic process with delta S is equal to zero from four to one. Now, Let's try this with an example problem. Now looking at number 31 for chapter six in your textbook, our working fluid is going to be refrigerant 134A and it undergoes a Carnot refrigeration cycle as we just outlined right here. So here's our Carnot refrigeration cycle. And we're going to have to determine the coefficient of performance for a refrigeration cycle. So remember that's beta. And I'm going to give you a little more information here. So I'm going to draw the TS diagram. So 
and T is going to be in degrees Celsius, and S is going to be in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And we're going to be operating in the vapor dome mostly. So here is temperature of zero degrees Celsius, will be our cool temperature. And we'll begin at state one, somewhere under the vapor dome. And then state two, we're going to end up with X2 is equal to one, so a saturated vapor. Then we're going to have a vapor, superheated vapor, at state three. And I'll give you P3 is 16 bar. Then we're going to end with X equal to zero. And I did not draw this very well. State one should be directly below state four because delta S from four to one is zero. So things we know, or we can infer from the givens, we know X2 is zero. We know X4 is one. We know that T3 is equal to T4. We know that S2 is equal to S3. We know that S4 is equal to S1. And we know that T1 is equal to T2. So we actually have a lot of information here, and we're trying to find beta, the coefficient of performance, which is going to be for Carnot or for uh, a reversible process or for this Carnot cycle. It's going to be Tc over Th minus Tc. So we know. Tc is zero degrees Celsius. So Tc is going to be 273.15 Kelvin. Since remember, we have to put absolute temperatures into uh, these ratios for uh, coefficient of performance, for efficiency. What else can we look up or what else do we know? Well, we could look up S2 since we know S2 is equal to S3. We're trying to find TH is really what we need. So we need some pathway to find T3 or T4. So let us look up S2 as a starting point since we know that S2 is equal to S3 and we know the temperature and we know the quality. So we can look up S2. And we're working with refrigerant 134A. So let me find that in our tables. Let's see. Okay, refrigerant 134A, we're gonna be in the vapor dome saturated refrigerant, liquid vapor, and we are going to be at a temperature of zero degrees Celsius. And so we can find the entropy for saturated vapor, which is gonna be 0 0.1, 0 0.919 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So we know S2, and that's gonna equal S3.
0 0.919 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Now we know P3, so we can try to find T3. We need T3. So going back to our table, we're going to want to find a pressure of 16 bar and we have an entropy of 0.919. We're going to try to match that in our tables and we know we're in superheated. So superheated refrigerant and we're at 16 bar. So there we are. And now we need to find an entropy of 0.919. Okay, so it's going to be somewhere up here between 60 and 70 degrees Celsius. So we're going to have to interpolate. So T3 is going to equal, this is going to be in degrees Celsius, 60 plus, so we want an entropy of not, it's a temperature that matches the entropy of 0.919. Our lower limit is 0 0.9069. And we're going to divide by the difference between our upper and lower limits. So it's going to be 0 0.94. Three seven minus zero point nine zero six nine, and our temperature is in ten degree increments, and we're in Celsius, and so this is going to be sixty three point one two degrees Celsius, which is equal to three thirty six point two seven Kelvin. Okay, so now we have TH, we have TC, we can go ahead and calculate beta. So beta is going to equal 273.15 divided by 336.27 minus 273.15 and the Units Kelvin will cancel, and this will give us um, a coefficient of performance of 4.33. All right, and that's it with that one. We're going to do two more example problems today since I think they're really great at illustrating the applications and allow and they allow me to talk you through the process of solving and working through these problems the thought process this is number 6.41 and we're working with air air contained in a rigid insulated tank i swear i did proofread these in a rigid insulated tank fitted with a paddle wheel initially at 300 Kelvin, two bar and a volume of two meters cubed is stirred until its temperature is 500 Kelvin. Assuming the ideal gas model for air and ignoring kinetic and potential energy, determine A, the final pressure in bar, B, the work in kilojoules, and C, the amount of entropy produced in kilojoules per Kelvin. So first we're gonna, we're gonna solve this two ways. We're gonna first solve it using data from table A22 for ideal gases. So using the S degrees that we talked about last class. So the entropy in the ideal gas tables based on the reference temperature lower limit. And second, we're gonna solve this using a constant CV uh, read from table A20 at 400 Kelvin, which is the average between 500 and 300 Kelvin. And then we're going to compare the results. So let's get started with just writing out our givens and drawing a little sketch of the scenario. Okay, so we have air in a rigid insulated tank. 
So here's my tank. It's going to be well insulated. This is air. And we have a paddle wheel. in it. So one word I want to notice is rigid. First word I see, rigid, tells us that delta V, change in total volume, is zero. Okay, so we have constant volume and also insulated, insulated, Tells us Q is zero, no heat transfer with the surroundings. We have T1 is 300 Kelvin. P1 is two bar. V1 going to be the same as V2 since delta V is zero, which is going to be two meters cubed. And also T2 is 500 Kelvin. We're using the ideal gas law. So PV equals R air T. And we can connect kinetic, we can neglect kinetic and potential energy. So we want to find A, P2, B, W, and C, we want to find the amount of entropy produced. All right, now let us begin. And a great place to begin looking for P2 would be looking at the ideal gas law. So let's start there. Give me one second, my notes are falling down. There we go. Get rid of one page. Okay, so solution. So let's find P2. And we know that P1, V1 is equal to M R air T1. So, so right here, the way I have the ideal gas law written, PV equals R air T is using the specific volume so if we wanted to write the ideal gas law using the total volume, we just need to multiply our air T by the mass M. And then we have P2, V2 is equal to M R air T2. And we know that V1 over M R air. This is going to be a constant mass problem. So M is going to equal this. It's a control mass problem. So M is going to be the same at the start of the end. So V1 over M R air is going to be the same as V2 over MR air, since all these quantities are equivalent, which is going to equal T1 over P1, which is also gonna equal T2 over P2. So we know these, these two ratios are equivalent, so that's a great place to start. And that just tells us that P2 is going to equal 
T2 over T1 times P1, which is just going to be 500 Kelvin over 300 Kelvin, or just simply 5 thirds times 2 bar. So P2 is going to equal 3.33 bar. I'm just going to write it up here because I have a little more room. So that's it for part A. So not too bad there. So for part B, uh, looking for the work in kilojoules, what we're going to need to do is set up an energy balance. Keep going. This is part B. And we need to find W. So starting with an energy balance, we have Q minus W is equal to M U2 minus U1. And we're dealing with U because this is a control mass volume. This is a control mass problem. There we go. And also we are neglecting the effects of kinetic and potential energy. And we were told earlier that this is a insulated system, so it's not exchanging energy with its surroundings. So we end up with minus W is equal to M delta U. And the thing is, we don't know M, or do we know M? So let's return momentarily to the ideal gas law. We know P1 and V1 is equal to M R air T1. So we have two equations. We can look up U2, we can look up U1. We need to find W, but we could also, in the meantime, solve for M using the ideal gas law. So M is going to equal P1 V1 over R T1. And remember our air is going to be 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Calvin. Okay. And we were starting at 2 bar, which is 200 kilopascals. So M is going to equal 200 kilopascals times two cubic meters divided by 0 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin and T1 was 300 Kelvin, which gives us M equal to 4.65 kilograms. Now, we need to look up U1 and U2. So U1, we know T1 and P1, and let's go to the tables for air. Overshot it a bit. A22, air. So we're at 300 Kelvin, and then we're going to look for U. There we are. And so U1 is going to be 214.07 kilojoules per kilogram. Two fourteen point oh seven kilojoules per kilogram. Similarly, we're going to look up U2 at 500 Kelvin, and that's going to give us 359.49 
kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, and so now we can go ahead and calculate W. So W is equal to M times U1 minus U2. And I just switched the order of U1 and U2, just to, I multiplied through by the minus one that was in front of the W. And so this is gonna be 4.65 kilograms times 214.07 minus 359.49 kilojoules per kilogram. And so work is gonna be minus 676.2 kilograms, kilojoules. So that'd be work done on the system, since it's negative. And similarly, we, so this was from using table A22. Similarly, we could calculate this using table A20. So we'd have to look up CV for 400 Kelvin using table A20. Here we are, air, CV for 400, Calvin is 0.726. This is a constant volume process. So we have CV is 0 0.726 kilojoules per kilogram Calvin. And so similarly, so this would be our first way of calculating W, so that was part I. So part two for calculating W, the other way, would be using W is equal to M C V T1 minus T2, which is gonna be 4.65 kilograms times 0 0.726 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin times delta T, which is 300 minus 500, which is minus 200 Kelvin. And so it should come out to kilojoules in the end. And so this gives us minus 675.2 kilojoules. So we get pretty close. So you could technically solve the problem either way. Now, one more step. We want to find the entropy produced in kilojoules per Kelvin. So let's look at delta S. This is part C. And if you recall from last lecture, or two lectures ago, we were looking at delta S is equal to integral from state one to state two of some infinitesimal change in Q over T of the surroundings at the boundary plus sigma. So this was the Clausius inequality. And we know because we're dealing with a well insulated container that del Q over T is going to be zero. So we're just left with delta S is equal to sigma. So this will give us the entropy produced. And so delta S is 
equal to sigma is equal to m times s2 minus s1 plus r times the natural log of v2 over v1. So here's the thing. We have a rigid container. So we have constant volume in this process. So the natural log of one is going to give us zero. And so then we just need to look up S2 and S1 in our tables. So S2 is going to be for a temperature of 500 Kelvin. We're going to look at it in A22. This would be the first way of solving it. And that's 300 Kelvin. And so we get S is going to be 1.6. 7.0203 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. So this is going to be 1.70203 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Similarly, we could look up S1 in A22 and we get. 2.21952 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And I think I have those backwards. Hold on a sec. So S, so T1 is 300 Kelvin. So that is S1, the first one. There we are. So then we end up with, this is going to equal, we already found M, so that's 4.65 kilograms times 2.21952 minus 1.70203 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, which is going to be 1.726 kilojoules per Kelvin. So this was using A22. That was our first method of solving this. So now let's try using CV. So with CV, we can find that sigma is equal to delta S, which is going to give us CV times the natural log of T2 over T1 plus R times the natural log of V2 over V1. So this is still zero. Since we have natural log of one there. And we looked up CV earlier. And so let's just calculate this. It's going to be equal to M, which is 4.65 kilograms, times CV, which was 0 0.726 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, times the natural log of 500 Kelvin over 300 Kelvin, which is five thirds, uh, which is going to give us 1.724 kilojoules per Kelvin. So once again, pretty similar. So that's two different ways of answering that problem. Two different methods, two different processes, two different methods. All right.
So let's do one more together. And this one is more of a derivation a bit. So this one, there's not any numbers for you to plug in. We're just going to be working with variables. And it's good for you to get used to working with variables because it's proper form to really go through a solution in variable form before plugging in quantities. We have a thermodynamic power cycle that receives energy by heat transfer from an incompressible body. So we can use the incompressible model of mass M and specific heat C initially at temperature TH. The cycle discharges energy by heat transfer to another incompressible body of mass M and specific heat C initially at a lower temperature TC. There are no other heat transfers. Work is developed by the cycle until the temperature of each of the two bodies is the same. Okay, so until we reach equilibrium, develop an expression for the maximum theoretical amount of work that can be developed. So W max in terms of M, C, TH, and TC. So this is a thermodynamic power cycle. So we have some higher temperature reservoir, TH, some lower temperature reservoir, TC, You're going to have some heat transfer occurring from TH, from the hotter reservoir to our system, and from our system to the cooler reservoir. So we have a cycle. And we're going to get work out. I'm just going to put a little boundary. Around our system. OK, now we want to find W max and we're given M, C, T, H and T, C. So let's begin with an energy balance. So we have Q minus W is equal to M times the sum of our changes in energy. And we're going to neglect kinetic and potential energy. And also, no heat is transferred between the system and the surroundings. So QCV is really what this Q is. And that's going to be zero. And for this piece right here, we can sub in delta U is equal to C delta T, since we're going to, we're given C. And so there's also some, another temperature in here. Uh, it's going to be our T final, our equilibrium temperature. So let us just define that for a second. So also let's consider TF. It's going to be T final. But we only want our answer in terms of TH and TC. So W going to end up equaling M C times T H minus T final. So I just switched the order here by multiplying through by the negative plus T C minus T final. So W is going to equal M C T H plus Tc minus 2t final. 
now we did an energy balance. Now let's do an entropy balance. Use the second law of thermodynamics now. So we have our entropy balance. So we're going to use delta S is equal to the integral from state one to state two of del Q over T of the surroundings across a boundary plus sigma. And once again, Q CV is going to be zero. So we're just left with delta S is equal to sigma once again. Which is going to equal delta S for our higher temperature to our final and delta S plus delta SC. So sigma is going to equal mass times C times the natural log of T final over TH plus the natural log of T final over TC. Right, so we're just using that delta S relation once again. And then we can merge these together. Let's try to condense them. We end up with sigma is equal to MC times the natural log of TF squared over THTC. Okay, now let's keep going. I'm going to add another page to work on. So now I'm going to divide through by MC. So the natural log of T final squared over TH TC is going to be equal to sigma over MC. And so I'm going to try to solve for TF since we do not want our answer to be in terms of TF. And so TF, so in order to do that, let's first um, raise each side to, raise E to the power, to each side. So we're gonna do the exponent, uh, the exponential of each side. So TF squared over TH, TC, is equal to e to the sigma over mc. So tf is going to be equal to th tc times e to the sigma over mc and we have to take the square root of that. So now let's plug in TF back into our energy balance. So W is going to be MC TH plus TC minus 2 th tc exp of sigma over mc to the one half and so here's something that we need to take from the problem statement we were looking for w max so in order to get 
W max, we need to have sigma equal to zero. We need to have a reversible process. So sigma is going to be zero for W max. That simplifies things a bit. So W max is going to be M C times T H plus T C minus two times the square root of T H T C. So what we just did here is we just derived the relation between TH and TC and mass and uh, specific heat capacity for a th theoretical maximum work output for a thermodynamic power cycle. So that's what we just did. All right. Well, that is it for this lecture. And I will see you next time where we're going to keep on going through um, practice problems dealing with entropy balances. See you next time.